All right, any questions? Okay, so let's go back to um, where we were on, on this projection. Because it's G-linear, it will preserve this decomposition. We have V upper G, meaning the vectors fixed by every element of the group, is a sub-representation. As such, it has a sub-representation complement W. And P V V for vectors that are fixed, because if a vector is fixed, every term in the sum will keep it as it is, and then you add a order of g times the same vector v, so the average is itself. And um, so phi takes the w to w because uh, this is a decomposition as representations, and phi is g linear. So this implies that the source is decomposition. So phi w. W, P of W also is in W, and it has to be zero because we checked that uh, phi of any vector, so for V and V, this belongs to V, V, G, also. This map, uh, V, the image. is the whole uh, VG. So that means that phi of W is in W, but it also belongs to the intersection. And the intersection is zero because we have a direct sum. So this implies phi of W belongs to both V of G and W, and this is zero. So that means that the map phi in this decomposition, if we take a basis for this subspace and a basis for W, um, the, the phi is in block form. Now on VG, it acts like the identity, it fixes everybody. And on W, it takes everybody to zero. So it has this form. <coughs> yeah. 
So in particular, the trace of phi just comes from the part that is the identity, and so that, whatever size that is, um, is the dimension of this first cell. Okay, so that's the part that I, I mentioned last time, but I didn't actually do it. So let's look at what that trace is. On the other hand, if we look at the definition, the trace is additive, so this is some g and g of the trace of g, but the trace of g is what we call the character. So let me call that, so we use the letter chi, maybe chi of v. So we conclude then that this, on one hand, is the dimension of vg, and on the other hand is the sum, the average of the values of the character. So this is uh, an important, uh, useful fact that we can discover what the dimension of the space of fixed vectors is if we know what the character is by taking the average of all the values. Okay, so this is uh, an important thing. So now, um, let's apply this to the uh, representation, which is going to be So this statement that we had over there was for an arbitrary <coughs> representation. So now consider that you had two representations, V and W, and we discussed that that gives rise to the representation on the linear maps between V and W. So I take this representation and apply this statement, and we get that the dimension of the linear maps that are fixed by G is equal to the sum and the average of the character values uh, chi of hom w g. Now we did two things about this hom. First, we saw that the character is the character, because HOM was this done as V dual tensor W, uh, it has, it's that character, and because the tensor product gives us the product of the characters and the dual gives us a conjugate, this is uh, like that. Okay, this on one hand, and on the other hand, we also worked out that the linear maps that are fixed by the group, the way that the group acts on the homomorphisms, this is in fact the subspace of G linear maps. So we did this before, being fixed by the group the way that the action was defined is exactly to ask that your linear map be not just linear, but also G linear. So with these two things together, we get the following. <coughs> so we proved. the 
dimension of the G linear maps between V and W is equal to the average of chi V conjugate of G times chi of W of G. Okay. So, with this in mind, it suggests that we could um, consider the right hand side and define for any two functions, alpha and beta, from G to C, define the inner product of alpha with beta. to be the sum of alpha g bar beta g. And now I realize that, um, well, this is an inner product, a Hermitian inner product on um, the space of, of functions, complex functions on G. But I realized that um, my inner products before the conjugate was on the second variable, and now naturally came to have a complex conjugate on the first. But hopefully won't be too confusing. It's a, it's a matter of choice how you define it. Okay, now, <coughs> so we just define this inner product on functions in G, and by looking at this expression, we can just formulate this with this definition, this notation, but it will be useful so let me rephrase what we proved yet again. And so say the dimension of the G linear maps from G to W is the inner product of the character of V with the character of W. On the left hand side we have uh, dimensions, so it's a uh, non-negative integer. On the right hand side we have an inner product from very specific functions. And moreover, we can now appeal to Schur's lemma. And let's see what happens if V and W are irreducible representations, not just arbitrary. What can we say about um, hom of hom g, that is, g linear maps between v and w? If you recall what we proved, that we call Schuh's lemma, what what can we say about the left hand side? Hmm? Well, if V and W are not isomorphic, then there's just there's no map other than the zero map. Yeah, between V and W. And there's no G linear map. 
And if they are isomorphic, there is uh, a one-dimensional space. Yeah, so what this says is that um, the dimension of the G linear maximum V and W is 1 if V is isomorphic to W and 0 if V is not isomorphic to W. So the conclusion is that chi, the functions chi V for V irreducible in this uh, language now view the dimension as an inner product um, these are orthonormal they're orthogonal and they have self uh, inner product one so what does that tell us about these functions What is uh, one implication? One is one implication of having this a set of orthonormal vectors in a vector space. The, so these chi of v belong to the. There's unfortunately no standard notation, but is a. Um, so let's just write it out. Space of class functions of G, which recall means functions alpha from G to C that are uh, stable under conjugation, so they're constant on uh, conjugacy classes. This is sitting inside the vector space of all functions on G. And we define an inner product on this space, and certainly a subspace inherits the same inner product. Yeah. So this shows that this generic function, the class function? Not yet. I mean, if you have vectors that are orthogonal, they are, in particular, what? Yeah. Linearly independent. Yeah? So the orthogonal part of this. implies that these guys are linearly independent. So chi v in orthogonal means that they're linearly independent. And if they're linearly independent, then what does it say about how many they are? Their, the number of such things is at most the dimension of the space that where they live. The dimension of the space is the dimension of the space of class functions. But that is exactly equal to the number of conjugacy classes. Because the function that is constant on conjugacy classes is determined by the value on each class and you can assign to each class any value you like so there's there is a conjugacy class <coughs> number of conjugacy <coughs> class choices uh, for for your function okay 
and we'll see in just a second that in fact this is inequality but in particular this tells us something which we mentioned but we didn't really know which is that the number of irreducible representations of a group is finite because a irreducible representation is going to be listed in here it's, one of, it's isomorphic to one of them in our set and there is at most conjugacy class number of them but there's a bit more being orthonormal means that if you give yourself a, a, a class function you can find how to decompose it in terms of these because in fact the, these are not just linearly dependent but they are a basis so in fact this is a so is an orthonormal basis for the space of class functions so they also generate and um, yeah so I'm still missing one small thing to prove this, but um, let me s first do something else. So we're going to find a number of consequences of what we're doing. So go step by step. So the first, um, so there's going to be several statements. So the first is that if I have a representation of G, we have a character, we define the trace of the elements, this is a class function, so the claim is that uh, chi of G uniquely determines the up to isomorphism so if you have two representations with the same character they, they are actually isomorphic and to see this we already uh, shown that a representation is um, a sum of irreducibles so let me write this like this where a1 ar are not negative integers and b1 up to vr are the set of irreducible representations up to isomorphism we just saw that this is the final list so we saw that a representation is decomposes as a sum of irreducibles the number of isom uh, isomorphism classes of irreducibles is finite so let me list them all. So B, B i is non-isomorphic to B j, for i different from j. And so we have the statement. Now, we also know that the character is an additive function. So the character V is necessarily the sum of the chi V i multiplied by A i.
So, um, now the k, k and b i are orthonormal. So, a i we can compute by computing the character, I mean the inner product, chi b, chi b i. So it's like decomposing a vector in a, in a normal basis. So, and these uniquely determined by chi of it. So if I know the character, I can compute this inner product which just uses the values of the character and I recover what the number ai is and this number ai tells me what the representation is up to isomorphism. So AI is called the multiplicity of the representation VI in V. So Let's, let's see what the logic is here. So if somehow you have the character of your representation and you know what you want to know what the representation is, you compute um, you know that it will have V will have this form. Uh, therefore it will be a linear combination of the irreducible characters in a unique way and you recover what that uh, multiplicity AI is from just the values of the character. So you get the V is of this form and the AIs are uniquely determined so um, because of the, the characters being independent and therefore there is up to isomorphism only one way of writing V. So you recover what V is from the character. The second statement is that um, V is irreducible <coughs> if and only if what? How can you tell from the character if the representation is irreducible. Hmm? Let me compute chi of B with itself. What is this in terms of the AIs? Well, if we just have an arbitrary representation V, we can write it like this. The, this K, chi VI is a, an orthonormal basis, so the inner product of the vector with itself is what? AIs are non-negative integers and the representation V will be irreducible if and only if there's only one term in here with the exponent 1. Okay, so um, we want to characterize when all the AIs are 0 except one of them which is equal to 1 and um, this can only happen if and only if this sum is actually equal to one. Right? If, um, if everybody is zero except for one of them, suddenly the inner product is one. And if the product is one, the only way that can happen 
is exactly that way, where all the integers ai are zero except for one of them, which equals one. Because if one of if there's more than one, the sum will be bigger than one. And if there's only one of them, and the sum is equal to one, uh, then it's that sum, uh, just lonely term has to be one. So with this character, we can tell if the representation is irreducible. So we finally, many things that we talked about uh, are all coming together now. So maybe let's make a, a small detour and look at the example of S3, which is the one we'll be using all along. So let's go back to this example and see how, how it's looking out with our uh, discussion so far. So we have um, three Three irreducible representations. We prove this by hand. Yeah. So let's just do a, a, a few calculations just to uh, get a sense of what's going on. So, for example, let's check indeed what chi of v chi of v is v now will be in the standard representation. So according to what we just discussed, this number should be 1. Yeah. So how do we compute this? Well, the inner product is by definition 1 6 of the sum of the character values. Now, the character values over all elements of the group. So there's one term coming from the identity. Then there's three terms coming from this conjugacy class. So I'm going to write it out like this. So just to, to indicate where the terms come from. There's two terms coming from this conjugacy class. And so this sum better be 6. So we have 4 plus 2, 6, divided by 6 is 1. So this indeed works out. This. Uh, some, this inner product by itself is 1, checks what we already knew, that this is irreducible according to this criteria. And just for the sake of it, let's just uh, do, for example, chi of v multiply with chi of u prime. This would be 1, 6. And then 1 times uh, 2 times 1 plus 3 times um, 0 times minus 1 plus 2 times minus 1 times 1. And so we have 2 here and minus 2 there, so indeed, indeed this is 0. And finally, let's just uh, go back to the calculation we did in, I think, two different ways, which is what is the decomposition of V tends to V. The character of this is the product of V with V, so it's kind of V squared. So this has values 4, 0, 1 in this order. And um, if you want to decompose this, we just take the inner product of this character with <coughs> the three reducibles. So um, let me put the values in here so to organize the calculation. So see what the inner product is. So remember, the, the, these are the values on the conjugacy classes, but the sum is over all the elements of the group. So we have to use these, these quantities to collect the terms that are equal. So 
So if we want to find what's the um, the component, the, the multiplicity of the identity component of the trivial component, um, we do four times one times one plus zero, and then this times two, so this four plus one this six. Six divided by six is one. So this is one. Four times one, one times one and zero. This is also one. And two times four is eight. Plus one times one times two. Minus. Two zero minus. Ah, oh minus is missing, thank you. So it's it's eight minus two is six divided by six is one. So all the multiplicities are one. And we conclude that this is isomorphic to this. We did this already, but I just wanted to um, do it again with what we've uh, talked about. So notice also that we had this formula for the dimension in general of the space of invariance, um, which was the average of the character values. We did this before. We discussed the inner product. This is in, for any V. And in the language of inner products, this is the character times the trivial character. So this is, or rather maybe to be precise, one with the char trivial character. So the trivial character with chi of e, um, and this, this is consistent with what we're saying, to find the multiplicity of the trivial representation, which is the dimension of the space of vectors that are fixed by the group, you have to take the inner product of the character with the trivial character. Okay, now you may recall that we discussed a representation called the regular representation. So the regular representation of G was a representation which we obtained by having the group G act on itself by multiplication, say, on the left. So here G acts, so the group G acts on the set G by left multiplication. And because it's a permutation representation, the character Let's call this character of chi, chi regular is computed by counting how many fixed points there are. But left multiplication always moves somebody except for the identity. So this, in which case it fixes everything. So the character is concentrated on the identity. So if we divide by the order of the G, this is uh, so the Dirac delta function at the identity. So let's uh, see what happens. With what we did, we can find how to decompose this representation, or any representation, in terms of irreducibles. So let's compute this decomposition. We take the inner product with uh, irreducible characters. But now, this inner product is very simple because when you compute, you have to take the sum, an average, of the values of the regular times the irreducible. But the regular 
is zero except for the identity. So in this sum, there's only one term. And that term is uh, the order of G cancels with order of G. And chi of VI, so we get order of G divided by order of G times chi of VI of 1. If G's cancel, and chi of V1 is the dimension of VI. So this representation is. Um, one which, for one thing, is really big. It contains all represent irreducible representations of the group and with multiplicity equal to their dimension. So the conclusion is this. the regular representation is isomorphic to the direct sum 1 to R of VI to the dimension of VI. So every irreducible representation appears as a summand of the regular representation. And in fact, it appears with multiplicity equal to its own dimension. So if you have a group um, with a, groups will tend to have large dimensional representations, then the, these are going to appear in the regular representation many, many times. And then another beautiful thing comes out of this, because what's the dimension of the regular representation? dimension is always, if you start with the permutation representation, the dimension of the associated representation, linear representation, is the size of the set. And here this is acting on the set which is the group G itself. So this is the order of G. Yeah, so that's, so tip, you have to think of this as a very big dimensional representation. That's on the left hand side. On the right hand side, um, it's a sum from i equals 1 to r. Now, each one of these, vi has the mention of vi, and it appears the dimension of vi times. So that means that this is the mention of vi squared. OK, so the order of g is the sum of the irreducible representations. So if we uh, think of S3 again, that's the only example we've done so far. Okay. Sorry, sorry, why is, why is it squared? Because I take dimension of both sides. I, VI has dimension VI, and it appears dimension of VI times. So let's say dimension of VI is 3, and I have it 3 times. So I have 3, 3, 3. So this is the product of this exponent times the dimension of the thing you're taking the exponent of power. Yeah. So for S3, your G is 6, and the representations that we found there were three of them and had dimensions one, one, two. So it checks. 
this up to six. Okay, the other observation is that the regular representation is like a delta function at the identity, it's like the Dirac delta. So if I define delta to be 1 if g is 1 and 0 if g is not 1, then I'm just going to rewrite the fact that the character of the regular is this has this composition. So this is equal to 1 over rho over g times chi di of 1 times <coughs> chi di. Or maybe let me write it more succinctly like this. Chi runs over the irreducible characters, that is to say, characters of irreducible representations, non isomorphic. I have chi of 1 times chi of g. So this is sort of the Dirac's delta has a decomposition into your irreducible characters and the coefficients are chi of 1 divided by g. Or maybe, so even somewhat more clearly write it that way. So this is the analog sort of the Fourier expansion of the delta function. And um, In case that the group is a billion, then all the irreducible representations are dimension one, so these numbers are all one, and we just get that the delta function is the is the average of the character values. In in general, for a non-abelian group, the coefficients are not just one over g, but the dimension of the irreducible representation comes in. Okay, so we still um, have to prove that um, there are as many irreducible representations as there are conjugacy classes. So far we have an inequality, but um, I'll come back to that. And what I'd like to do now is do uh, the example of S4. Which is now a bit more more substance than than S three, which is the only one we group, group we did. Okay, so we'll try to fill out the the uh, character table. So. Um, have the conjugacy classes are given by the cyclotypes. So we have um, two cycles, three cycles, four cycles, and then products of two cycles. And that's all we can have. Um, so this corresponds to partitions of four. number four. This would be the identity would correspond to if we write it in this diagram form would be this. Oh, maybe I'll, um, yeah, maybe I'll write it up here. So here's the this partition of four, namely one plus one plus one plus one, four times. 
This is the cycle decomposition of the identity. Here we have a two cycle, and then uh, two one cycles. This one has three, and one, one cycle. This is yeah, so these are only four ways, uh, five ways to write four as a sum of uh, non negative integers. Where I don't care what they were. Yeah? So these are all the possible uh, cycle types of, of elements of S4. And now we should find at least, um, well, not more than five years of <coughs> representation. And as I keep saying, in fact, there should be exactly five. Okay. So let's just uh, do this exercise and start listing all the reducible representations we can think of. So there should be two you should be able to tell me right away. We have the trivial representation, and here I'm writing the character. Well, before we get to the standard, there's another one that is easy to say. The sign representation, which we know with prime. So this is one. Yeah? Okay, so we have two, we have uh, three more to go. Um, we have the standard representation, which we always have for any SN. And I mentioned, although we might prove that later or not, I'm not sure if we have had the time, is actually irreducible. And so let, let's list it, and we can check. Now that we have our tools with the inner product, we can check that it is indeed irreducible by hand. Let's do that. But what is the character of V? Sorry? Recall that we did this as we looked at the fixed points and subtract one. Right? Because it's the defining representation of S4 naturally acts on 4 on, on 1, 2, 3, 4. That gives rise to a four-dimensional representation, and we take away one corresponding to the line where the, all the coordinates are the same, and that gives us now a three-dimensional representation. So this is three. This fixes two things. This fixes one. This fixes none. And this fixes none. Right? And before we check that this is indeed irreducible, we can produce another one. From what we have. We can always, if we have a, a representation V, say irreducible, and a one dimensional representation, we can always take the tensor product of one with the other, and this will uh, also be irreducible. In general, if you take the, the tensor product of two representations, if each term is irreducible, the tensor product will t likely not be irreducible, as we've seen with when we did the example of S3. But if one of them is one-dimensional, then the product, in fact, is irreducible. It's a simple thing to verify. So I'll use the prime to indicate that we tensor with the sign representation. So this would be, just take the product of these two rows. So we're missing one representation. So let's, um, let's check that the standard representation is irreducible. 
We can do that by computing the character in the product with itself. So this is 1 over 24, 3 squared, 1 times 3 squared, plus this, oh, this write these numbers down. So how many two cycles are there? In S4 choose 2. Huh? 24 choose 2. 24 choose 2. Is that right? To give a two cycle, you have to have two elements. Yeah. So there's 24 choose 2 pairs, but 1, 2 is the same as 2, 1. So it's 24 pairs, 24 choose 2 divided by 2, and that is, uh, what is it? <coughs> no, no, why 24 choose 2? Sorry. It's 4 choose 2. We are two, we're picking four numbers out of 1 through 4. Sorry. So it is, otherwise, that would be huge. Uh, four, uh, so 4 choose 2 divided by 2. This is 1 half of 4 times 3 over 2. Uh, no, 4. Six? Yeah. Three. Divide by uh, no, we don't have to divide by two. So I mean, it's too big. I mean, it's a six. It's just pairs. Yeah. You just it doesn't you put them in whatever order you like. Just pairs. Sorry. Okay. And what about three cycles? Um, it's the same as picking the guy you don't pick. So there's four. But then in here. Um, is not just a set because it's, um, uh, one two three is not the same as one three two. Yeah. So there should be uh, four possible sets of three things, but each set gives you two three cycles that are different. So it's eight. Um, how many four cycles? You picked all the numbers now, but then you can reorder them. Uh, and there's actually two of them. Yeah? Uh, no? Sorry, I'm not doing this right. How many different four cycles are there? Um, there's six. And one, two, three, four, there's three. You should. Uh, I'm not doing a good job explaining this, I think you should think of it. Uh, go with this yourselves. Okay, so it's a, it's, a, it's a good exercise to do this by hand in this case, and we may come back and do, try to think of this in, in the general, if you do this for Sn, how many, uh, what would be the numbers you have to put here. So they, this is uh, something you want, would need to do to get started with uh, understanding the characters of Sn. All right, so let's go back to this. Uh, we compute the inner product. So, um, so this would be 6 plus 1 squared plus 8. I'm going to write all the numbers down just to illustrate exactly what we're doing. 8 times 0 squared plus 6 times minus 1 squared plus 3 times minus 1 squared. And this um, is 9 plus 6, 15, plus 6, 23. Uh, what, am, what am I doing? This should come out to be 24. Is it, is it right? Yeah. So it's 24, the service is 1, and the thing is e reduced. Okay? And the proof for general n is essentially the same. You, have, you can check that the inner product of the character of the standard representation for Sn with itself is 1. And the calculation, you can do it for every, any n, and it's a bit uh, involved, but uh, it, you, so it's not just plugging in numbers, you have to do this where n is arbitrary, but it, it's, a, it's a nice uh, combinatorial uh, calculation, which, as I said, uh, we may come back and do it. All right, so the same thing happens if I do with the sign. The thing is, for example, you can see here that the character values are squared, and so if you tensor by 
by the sign, you're not going to change the squares, and so the sum is still going to be, uh, the inner product is still going to be 1. <laughs> so all of these are irreducible, and um, in a certain sense, we can figure out what the character of the missing representation is without knowing what the representation actually looks like. So for example, you can tell me um, what is the dimension of the missing representation. And how do we know, in fact, that we're missing one? For all we know, the, the, this group has only four irreducible representations. How do we know four is not all of them, and what is the dimension of the missing one? What do we know about the dimensions of the reducible representation? The squares sum up to the order of the group. So if we look at the ones we have, we have 1 plus 1 plus 9 plus 9. So that's 18 plus uh, 2 is uh, 20. 20 is not 24. That means that we don't have all the reducible representations. And in fact, we're missing at least one, but we know they cannot be more than one because the total number is less or equal to five. So we're missing one of dimension exactly two. Because we get a sum of 20 and we have to get to 24. So we're missing a two squared. So in fact, I can just unequivocally say that whatever it is that we're looking for has a two there. In fact, we can work out what uh, is the rest of the row? How would you do that? Without even writing down any vector space or anything, just sort of uh, purely from the, the point of view of characters, which is what is the beauty about this whole theory, I keep mentioning, that you can do a lot of things about the irreducible representation without actually ever doing something uh, concrete with them. You can talk about them without having exactly, explicitly what that uh, action of the group is. So what is the property of the numbers that are missing? Sorry? So what do we know about the character of these reducible representations? That they are orthonormal. So we have four vectors in a five-dimensional space. These are orthonormal, and we're missing one vector that has to be orthogonal to all of the other ones and have length one. So that uniquely determines it uh, once we know that one number of the, of the entries is two. So the, the conditions on the, ele the numbers that are missing is such that are completely determined by what we have so far. So chi of w is uniquely determined by what we have. So think of it schematically like this. We have a four-dimensional space, which I'll do two-dimensional because they cannot draw. And then, so these are these will be chi of u, chi of u prime, etc. And then we're missing is chi of v, w, which will be perpendicular to all of them. So what we have to do is, is just a solve a linear algebra problem, which is impose the condition <coughs> that these numbers all have uh, in a product zero with everybody else. And that gives us uh, conditions, and then the norm and the fact that it starts with a two uniquely determines it. OK, but uh, we'll do some. So that's a, a bit can be done, but, um, but I'd rather do it some a different way. So <coughs> how would you find, how would you go about trying to find this representation? Well, all 
also, you may be able, the numbers are sufficiently small, you may be able to spot what the, what the right values are without writing down the equations. Zero. Zero for the first. Why is it possible to, to find the numbers with the conjugate plan? How would you do that? Yeah, each, you impose the condition that this vector is orthogonal to that one, is orthogonal to this one, orthogonal to that one, and orthogonal to that one. So that gives you four linear equations on four numbers, and you will be able to find them. But I'm just saying that I don't want to write the equations down and try to solve them by hand. I think maybe with a bit of uh, effort, we can just kind of spot where they should be. Are the first two? The first and second row should be orthogonal, right? This, these two are certainly orthogonal. But Every, all four rows are orthogonal with each other. But the inner product is not one. It should be zero. It's not zero. It's one. It should be. Otherwise, we did something wrong. Let, we should check that the inner product of these two things is zero. So let's see. It would be one minus six. Uh -oh. Plus 8, yeah, so these numbers are important because the inner product is the sum over all elements of the group, not on just the conjugacy classes. Yeah? So we should have, so 1 plus 8 plus 3, so that's uh, 12, and 6 and 6 is 12. So this, right? So we have 1 plus 8 plus 13, uh, plus 3 is uh, 12. Minus six, minus six, that's zero. So if the, if the rows are orthogonal, the columns are orthogonal. Yes. So this, this makes we just solving. Yeah, but orthogonal. You have, uh, the problem is you have these uh, multiplicities, and not just orthogonal in the usual sense. These two vectors are not orthogonal if you don't take into account the numbers six, eight. Okay, um, let's just leave it at that. Let's maybe, maybe two, one, minus one, then one, one, I think maybe that's close, but not quite right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, let's try to find this representation in a different way by actually finding a representation of dimension two. So how would you go about finding a representation of S4 of dimension 2, which hopefully will be irreducible. We can look for a permutation representation, uh, yes. We can also look for a um, linear representation. So, in both we can do it both ways. In both cases, it is useful to know a bit about the structure of the group S4. So, what do we know about this group? Hmm? It's okay to work with. Is it simple? That is, a, does it have non-trivial normal subgroups? What are the normal subgroups of S4? A4. A4 is always simple for any n. We have this. Is A4 simple? Well, Galo would be very unhappy with you guys. A4. A4 is. You cannot solve the equation at degree 5 or higher, right? Because. Because S5 is not simple. Because A, S5 has only one normal subgroup, namely A5. Yeah? It's not solvable. You, you've seen that, right, in Galois theory? A4 has a group order 4, so it's 
is solvable. S for is solvable, and that's why you can solve the degree four equation. Uh, yeah. A, a bar has a group of order four. It has a group of order four. A group of order four, so the quotient would be a bigger. So it is solvable. And this group A is the famous group that goes by the name of Klein group, which consists of the identity and all products of two cycles. So this is something of an accident that for n equals to 4, this is in fact a normal subgroup of S4. Okay, and this as a group is isomorphic to the cyclic group of order two with itself, and it's uh, usually it's called called the Klein group. Although fear in German, you know, it's just a standard name. So Klein got his name attached to this rather simple situation. And I claim that this knowledge is actually useful um, to produce our missing representation. So A is the normal, in fact A is a normal subject of S4. So this, I claim, gives you a way to act, to have S4 act on three things. representation of S4, this gives us one, because S3 has the standard representation, which is dimension 2. So we can just uh, compose uh, this projection to with the um, standard representation of S3, and it's it's simple to see that if this representation of S3 is irreducible, so, so is the corresponding composition. So that would be a simple way to get that one. But more or less in the same vein, I claim that you can see that S4 directly, so this abstractly tells us that S4 acts in somehow in three things. It acts in four, but it acts in somehow in a more mysterious way on three things. Um, so, I claim that we can see this acting on a set that has three elements um, more directly. And the point is to look at these guys here. The group A is normal, so if you conjugate one of these elements by an element of S4, it will go to one of the others. The conjugation fixes the identity and then has to move the other ones to itself. So uh, 
it acts on x, where x is that set, by conjugation. And this directly uh, shows you how S4 acts on S3. And it will be, in fact, give rise to this uh, isomorphism. Because this group is abelian, conjugated by the elements of x itself don't do anything. So let's see how that works. Um, so let me list the elements of x. And for each one of the representatives of my conjugacy classes, let's see what they do in this set. And with this, uh, we can compute the character because we look at the number of fixed points minus 1. So the identity suddenly fixes everything. So it takes each one to itself. So let me write schematically diagrams like this. So what does one do do? When you conjugate a cycle type, the, the action of conjugation is to act on the numbers inside the cycles. So conjugated by 1, 2 takes 1 to 2 and 2 to 1, so it leaves the cycle as it is and leaves the cycle as it is. So this guy stays the same. But then 1, 3, 2, 4 goes to 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, sorry, 1, 2, sorry, 2, 3, 1, 4, which is this guy. So this does this. Uh, 1, 2, 3 takes 1, 2, 3, 4 to uh, 2, 3, 2, 4. So it goes to that one. And so it goes to this one, and it, this one goes to this one, and then one goes back. And you can just do the, all of these guys. And you'll find, so the next, next one fixes this one and swaps this one with this one. And then 1, 2, 3, 4 is in the subgroup, so commutes with everybody. It acts like this. So this is schematic way of seeing exactly how this permutation representation works. So I just listed not all 24 <coughs> elements, but just representatives of each conjugacy class, which is enough to, to compute the character. So the identity fixes everybody. So um, it's three fixed points, minus one is two. Two we knew already. The next one fixes one point, And so uh, one minus one is zero. So this indeed should be zero. The next one fixes nobody. And so this would be minus one. And one, two, three, four fixes one guy. So uh, this should be zero. And the last one fixes everybody. So this should be two. mistaken that is our missing block. So let's just, uh, for example, let's just, well, we can verify that it's irreducible. Let's just do it without writing it down. So I take the inner product of this thing with itself. It will be 4 plus 8 plus 12. So that's 24. The value by 24 is 1. So this thing has inner product with itself 1. And just for the sake of it, let's just check that this w is orthogonal to v. So we would do 3 times 2, 6, times 0, times 0, times 0, times minus 2, times 3 is also 6. So, so the So, so this makes the, hmm? this makes the, uh, the columns uh, perpendicular to each other. Yeah, the columns are going to be, uh, this is sort of a second uh, uh, orthogonality relation that comes from uh, the first one. Yeah, so the, now I, 
don't want to state it in general. I want to make sure I get it right. But uh, we have to use somehow these numbers have to uh, come in. Because it's not orthogonal. It's orthogonal with respect to our, our inner product, but our inner product has these, these sort of multiplicities built in. So well, I'll come back to that. OK, so this is our um, character table of S4. And um, so we see indeed that there are these five irreducible representations. Um, There's only one other thing maybe I'll mention about this uh, table. Um, there's something that uh, holds for the dimensions of the irreducible, irreducible representations that is probably the less obvious of all the facts, and which is you may be able to guess from what we have here. The dimensions only came out to be 1, 2, and 3. Um, what can you, if you can you make a conjecture, what should the dimensions be in general? Maybe a little too speculative. Could be, but that's not quite right. We have very little data, so I understand. But, uh, so, what we'll see later is that the dimension of an irreducible representation, the irreducible, is some integer, positive integer, divides the order of the okay. So that's a, a pretty non obvious fact. Okay, so in the last five minutes I wanted to do an example of um, with S3, go back to this calculation we did with S3 of the tensor product of V with V, but I, now I want to um, so V is the standard representation I want to discuss sim 2 of V and this is yet another algebra, linear algebra construction that will uh, we will again consider as on the representation level <coughs> and let me do it for this example and then come back and discuss more generally what this um, this same means so V recall we had uh, chosen as basis took standard representation as three vectors that, whose coordinates add up to zero, and this is the basis, and the action is by permutation of the coordinates. So this, we call this V1 and this V2. So sim2 V is a um, 
going to be we can think of as a sub uh, space of V tensor V and V tensor V had basis V1, the tensor products of each basis vector with itself with, uh, with all the others so this is dimension 4 and sin 2 of V consists of products of pairs of vectors of the basis but where now we're going to in, uh, impose a further condition that it doesn't matter in what order the pro you take the product, the vectors are the same. So you will have basis V1, V2, V2, V2. So it has, it's um, three-dimensional. And let me mention, um, I'll come back to this to do it in more general form, but there's something called wedge 2 which is, as I mentioned in this case, 1, which will consist of doing uh, these products, but now um, if you change the order, you change the sign. So V1 uh, wedge V1 is 0, and V1 wedge V2, V2 is the same as minus V2 wedge V1, so there's only one surviving vector when you do have a product that is Q symmetric. So this is having a tensor, like replacing the tensor product by a product which is symmetric, so the order doesn't matter. This is replacing the tensor product by a product where the order changes sign. And, and these two um, add up to the, to the whole uh, V tensor V in this case. Okay, so what um, we'll do in general is that these two constructions, sin and wedge, actually also can be given um, as a meaning when you have V is a representation of a group G, and um, they will themselves be <coughs> representations of the group G. Yeah, so maybe I'll, what I was going to do is do the same calculation we did last time for, um, for the sim, that I think is not worth our time now. But maybe what we could do is uh, quickly see what representation is this one. So West 2 is dimension 1. And S3 has two representations of mixing one, so we can see which one it is. So V1, let's recall uh, we had, we've done this before, so tau of V1 was V2, and tau of V2 was minus V1, minus V2, and sigma of V1 was uh, minus V1 and sigma V2 we worked out was V1 plus V2. So let's just uh, finish by finding what happens to V1 wedge V2. So tau of this, tau will act on each factor. So this would be tau of V1 wedge tau of V2. So it's like what we did with the tensor product, except that now our product is Q-symmetric, but everything else is the same. So we have V2 wedge minus V1 minus V2. 
this uh, wet product is bilinear, or skew, but now skew symmetric. So we have minus V2 times wet V1 and minus V2 wet V2. V2 wet V2 is 0, and V2 wet V1 is minus V1, V2, which with the other minus sign cancels. So tau fixes the basis vector V1, which V2. And let's see what sigma does. So sigma uh, of V1, which V2 is sigma of V1, which sigma of V2. My, this is minus V1, which V1 plus V2. So it's minus V1, which V1, minus V1, which V2. So this is 0, so it's minus V1, which V2. So on this one dimensional representation, so indeed it is a one dimensional representation, sigma and tau take it to this, this vector to a multiple of itself we see that uh, wedge 2 or B is isomorphic to the sign representation. Tau is trivial and sigma changes sign. Okay, and so next uh, time we'll work on sign 2 or B, we'll see that this is isomorphic to U wedge. And the sum of the three is the tensor product of B with B. Okay, so the, the, this, um, these three products, tensor, wedge, and sim, are important for um, our discussion. So I'll um, spend some time with the general case at some point. Okay.